Welcome back to another edition of the FODcast, the show that brings you the cutting edge insights into the future of digital commerce from the biggest leaders operating in the space right now. Every two weeks, we are bringing you interviews with people either dominating or innovating within that digital commerce sector. So these people have kindly given up their time to tell us all about their story, uh, where they've got to and how they've got there, all in the aid of providing all you listeners with a glimpse of the future of digital commerce. We'll be bringing you people from all spheres of digital commerce tech, from retailers and systems integrators, right through to software vendors and full service digital agencies. Uh, incredibly, we are on episode five already. Don't know where that time has gone. We've had so many great guests already with incredible insights into the world of digital commerce tech, and there's plenty more to follow. Today, I am very excited to welcome to this edition, Peter Bergeroff. Am I saying that right? Yeah, perfect. I've been practicing that for about a week. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, Peter, you are from Boston Consulting Group. Uh, we first became acquainted in the, uh, in the height of the pandemic last summer. Um, BCG is a pioneer in business strategy operating globally for over 60 years with around 22,000 employees, uh, supporting the growth of the business and helping to generate almost $9 billion uh, a year in revenue. So the retail and digital, uh, the retail digital and technology arm focuses on improving the commercial proposition formats and omni-channel operations capabilities needed for uh, retailers across the globe, helping them to deliver their strategy. That is the part of the business you head up as partner and director. Uh, so you are responsible for the retail digital and technology business in Amsterdam. And uh, you're also a former Olympic rower, I believe. Well, a sailor, so I had to do with water, yes. Uh, okay. It's okay. a long time ago, though. Yeah. Absolutely. So something, something I'm sure we'll speak about later. But uh, that's my uh, my attempt at giving you instruction. Hopefully, I did you justice. It'd be uh, great if you could give me a, a bit of an intro yourself. Of course, yes. Well, thanks, Tim, for the intro. So as, as, as you said, I mean, I'm working in this field of, of the intersection of retail and technology for quite a while now. Uh, I started my career at, uh, at Capgemini and very quickly after that joined a company where we developed uh, web applications for, for um, companies from all sorts of, sorts of uh, different uh, sites. It was in the late sort of uh, 90s, early 2000s, where we actually developed together with, with a bunch of colleagues uh, the first websites, the e-commerce websites for retailers in the Netherlands, um, which was a lot of fun, but clearly was like a very siloed stovepipe next to the business setup of an e-commerce website and trying to sell all the all the products or part of the catalog uh, to, to sort of people on, online. After that, I moved to New Zealand, uh, where I was a CIO of a retail company. So I literally sort of really run a, a team of, of, uh, of people where we supported the full sort of end-to-end -end technology landscape, all the way from point of sale systems, supply chain, but also uh, elements around the um, the, the online uh, proposition as well. And we started to build some basic uh, database, uh, data warehouse uh, capabilities. The really interesting thing was there that we really learned that all, all sort of mainframe based like, architectures were very difficult to, to, um, to support the ongoing business. And definitely with the changing world of, of also um, more and more things becoming digital in store and online, we needed to really replace and modernize that landscape. Um, so this was in the, um, a 2005 sort of time frame um, where the technology wasn't fully ready yet to become uh, microservices based, but definitely things like service oriented architectures and more um, you know, componentized de web developments like uh, headless, headless type setups were more and more common uh, those days. After I um, was working with, uh, with this retailer in New Zealand, um, I worked for a little while for an Indian IT company just to learn the IT outsourcing mechanisms. But 13 years ago, I then decided to join Boston Consulting Group because I thought it was very interesting to see the intersection of how business looks at the use of technology and how technology tries to meet that expectation of delivering sort of new capabilities back to the business and the customers. And I always felt there was a need for helping this sort of um, build a building bridge, literally, uh, between what the business or the customers want and what technology can provide. And I think what has been super interesting in the last 30 years is technology has evolved so quickly with cloud computing, with, with data, data lakes, with uh, digital capabilities, with different sort of mobile front ends. 
has been really sort of accelerating so much that I think technology has so much more to give to the business and the customers um, that all of a sudden you got this massive opportunity uh, out there to, to really provide a, an amazing experience for, for both employees and for, for customers. And I think that's exactly the cool thing within BCG that we don't necessarily build a lot of things to, uh, to, for, 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 for our retail clients, but we do help them to think about, okay, how do I now look at technology, where to take the best opportunities um, from those new developments, and how do you then organize both internally, but especially also within your partner network to try to then deliver those new digital uh, setups. So that's a bit of sort of my journey over the years. Yeah, and I, I would definitely touch upon the change in technology uh, during your time with BCG in more detail shortly. It'd be good just to go back to the start of your career though, Peter, as um, it looks like you went straight into your consultancy role with Capgemini. Um, and then very quickly, um, I think over a period of maybe seven to eight years, you, you moved into a CIO role for the, uh, the business in New Zealand. So um, that seems very fast tracked in terms of career from entry role into CIO. So it'd be interesting to understand a bit more about how you, uh, how you manage that step up in responsibilities. Yes, well, the, the, the CIO role was, was a uh, very interesting opportunity. I all of a sudden got, was given uh, literally by the, by the uh, CEO of, of, of the retailer in New Zealand. It literally was a um, pippy long stocking situation. Like I've never done this before, so I'm pretty sure I can do it type of setup. Um, I, I, was, I was lucky to have a very good team of, of colleagues to work with, um, but, but when I joined the company, I, we very quickly sort of realized that the mainframe sort of old legacy IT setup wasn't the right thing to do. And we jointly worked together on building a plan on how to then move away from it, which is very much driven around sort of an SAP landscape and a Microsoft based sort of uh, architecture uh, in, in the front of it. Um, and then the key question was, what's the right sort of leader to try to help us move from the mainframe world to this sort of new modern architecture? And that was literally sort of this gap um, we were seeing. And that, that is literally where the discussion went together with the CEO saying, okay, but who is then capable of leading us to get there? And I, having done that work together with my company in the Netherlands, um, was saying, I think I, I can do this, um, but I just do need to support from all my colleagues to get this done. And that's how we got started. So it was a very much of a, I wasn't the, I mean, obviously I was the, the sort of the CIO, uh, but it was very much sort of leaning on, on my management team to jointly sort of really make sure we were able to, to establish this. And of course, then after a few years, I grew into it. Yeah? So, so after a little while, you sort of really understand what it takes to be a full CIO, what, what responsibilities come with it, how to really sort of help also people to grow. I also helped other sort of junior members to become part of the management team. So they, they also learned, learned the ways how to sort of manage teams. So I think from then onwards, I was much sort of stronger in the CIO role, but in the beginning, it's very much like, okay, we need to get this job done. Let's all jointly jump in. And I took the role of the leader at, at that particular moment of time. No, so sometimes that just needs to be done. And you know what you kind of learn on the job sometimes, right? And actually yep. about just being willing to just jump in and, and move into the unknown and you, and you, you just back yourself to, to make it happen over a period of time. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I mean, and of course, the benefit of that I had the, the luxury of having done a number of sort of these type of projects in my past life already. So it was very much almost like a senior project leader in the beginning. And later on, I really, as I said, grew into the role of the line manager. Um, so I think it was in the beginning very much like, okay, getting your hands dirty and get the job done uh, type of attitude. And then later on became more like building a team and also building a team to then hand over uh, at the time it was time for me to move on, that there was also an, an established team who could then run, run the business moving forward. Yeah, well, you definitely had the right background coming from both um, Capgemini and, and TamTam, which uh, you say are now uh, part of Depth Agency, who are obviously a very well-known agency. Um, so there's a good, what, six and a half, seven years of, uh, of tr retail digital transformation experience within those businesses, first of all, so it put you in good stead. Absolutely, yep. And then please don't forget that. It also depends in, on, on the people you work with. Uh, so building a team around, having a team around you who's, who's also very, very capable of running, running the different departments. Um, and I think that the, the big advantage was also that being in a, in a place like, for example, New Zealand, it's very much of a can-do attitude environment. So I think it also really helps if you're much more in a corporate sort of environment where people are much more like career paths and things have to go a certain way, then things would have maybe taken a bit longer for me to, as well to develop in that direction. Yeah. I mean, the other question I had as well is, is you spent the vast majority of your career 
uh, consultancy side. So Capgemini, TamTam, HCL, and uh, most recently uh, Boston Consulting Group, where you've been now for, for the best part of 14 years. Mm-hmm. Do you feel as though that's enabled you to um, almost move forward and progress quicker, given the fact you're constantly involved in different projects with um, different demands and deadlines you need to hit? Absolutely. I think being a consultant is such a great opportunity to learn and to grow quickly in the, sort of as a person, but also in, in, in filling your bag with sort of experiences. Um, being a line manager, um, as, as for example, I did at Farmers in New Zealand, it, it things take longer to sort of learn and experience. Um, the nice thing is that you really get to be part of building something. Eh? So that's sort of the flip side, of course, uh, of, of being at the consultant side, which consultancy really helps you to do multiple things frequently, projects, I mean, especially the Boston Consulting Group sort of frequency of projects is like every three months you do something else uh, type of rhythm, um, which really helps you to do to learn new things over and over again. Having said that, though, I think what I see happening right now is that consultancies also need to take on more responsibilities of delivery and helping sort of clients to own, uh, to get things done. Um, so I actually do feel that, that the projects we've been doing also with, with BCG, but I also hear from other colleagues uh, who work in the industry, um, that actually being a consultant is not only advising, it's actually also really helping to get things done, which I think actually is, is way more fun, but I definitely also leverage my, uh, my experience from the CIO times in New Zealand there as well. Yeah, 100%. And I imagine the advice you've been given over the, um, the last 20 years or so from a digital commerce technology point of view has probably changed quite a bit, given what's happened during that period of time and the advancements of technology as well. Oh, for sure. Yes. <laughs> Things have moved on quite nicely. Yeah. I mean, I still remember that the first time we did like e-commerce solutions it was much more like how do we get the box to work and configure it in the right way. Um, the first time we did data warehouses, it was more like, uh, I think, star, star schemas were the most advanced way of thinking about how to structure your data uh, to, to provide really cool sort of analysis and reports with. And if you now think about sort of clouds and microservices and, and data lakes and mesh, data mesh, et cetera, I mean, things have moved on so quickly. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. And to be honest, what I really like about the current state of where technology is at, I don't think it's actually technology being a limitation. I think it's actually the creativity of how you apply those technologies um, in the environments is really the nice thing how to put things together. So I think we're at the point also where it not necessarily needs to be expensive to do new things, uh, where it used to be more sort of, if you want to be leading edge, it will cost you a lot of money. Now I think actually leading edge doesn't necessarily cost you a lot of money. You just need to have the creativity and the sort of the skilled people around you to, to deliver. And also the desire. So I was reading an article the other day and, uh, there's still retailers who are investing one to two percent of their total revenue into their digital channels, whereas the leaders are investing five to seven percent. So Absolutely, Tim. Yeah. Still not always the the desire at a board level to want to actually make that jump. Uh, to be honest, I mean, great you mentioned that because to be honest, if I think about most of my discussions I have with senior leadership, that this is exactly the topic. If you want to become sort of digital, if you want to really lead. This is the consequence. You need to really start putting money in, in, into, into tech. I mean, this, is, this doesn't come for free, um, which has a lot of other implications as well. I mean, like previously, IT was seen as a cost center. You need to really make it as efficient as possible. That's also why big monolithic systems came up because that sort of helped you to, to become sort of cost efficient. Um, mm-hmm. But now, yeah, ha- having sort of these type of spend levels also require a lot of different, I mean, different ways of how you think about spending tech money uh, is actually quite an interesting sort of shift, which we will probably touch upon later on as well. Yes. Oh, yeah, I certainly will. Um, for me, one of the things that would be interesting to understand about Boston Consulting Group is it's a huge, huge business with so many different parts of the business. And there's 22,000 people, roughly. How many people are, are you responsible for in, in the retail technology digital group? So we, we work with a team, I mean, BCG is in, in, indeed an interesting company. <laughs> I think we have a lot of different dimensions how we're organized. So we do, we're organized by office, we're organized by industry, and we're organized by, um, you could say, functional specialism. Um, okay. And I think all those three, three dimensions sort of come together at some, some, some way. Uh, for me, the way BCG comes together is in the retail technology sort of dimension. So it's retail industry and it's technology. Um, and I think if you look to, to the amount of people who really work on this intersection of retail and technology together, um, then you more talk about uh, sort of 
at anywhere between 50 and 100 people. However, if you look to the amount of people working at LNZ, and even you look to the amount of people in working on in retail, then the numbers get way bigger very, very quickly. Okay. Then on top of this, the interesting thing is that, so for example, if you talk about uh, building um, Atlas architectures, there's also non-retail experts who know how to do that. So then of course, I can leverage a lot of experience from our colleagues who do that type of work in the technology sort of area. Whereas a lot of retail experts, to be honest, the same as our retail clients, they need to understand more about digital. Also, my colleagues start to learn a lot about digital these days. Like 13 years ago, I was the only one who was able to talk tech. Now I think are oh, at least half to with three quarters of my colleagues, I can actually have a pretty good conversation with the CIO on technology topics uh, quite nicely. So I think that's also exploding as well. So I think that the numbers are, are quite big, Tim. But, but the thing is, we don't manage ourselves that way. We, we just sort of uh, combine teams whenever needed from different sort of client uh, demands. And do you, do you find that having so many different capabilities within BCG allows you to uh, win bigger clients, bigger projects, because you can provide not just an e-com platform or consultation on the on this digital commerce tech, but you've got a multitude of other things you can bring to the table. Absolutely. I think that's I think that's what BCG has done very, very nicely a few years ago as well, to recognize the need to also have certain specialisms within our firm itself. So for example, we have a very good team who knows a lot about data analytics. Uh, we call them Gamma, uh, BCG Gamma, uh, which is a part of part of BCG. We also have a part of BCG called BCG Patinian, which are more sort of data architects and experts in technology architectures who are really understanding how to look at the data landscape or the technology landscape and how to improve that. Um, so we have different sort of, and then we have digital ventures, for example, as well. BCG Digital Ventures are really good in building new digital ventures, capabilities, um, attacking or in, integrated within the, 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 the bigger sort of client environment. So I think having those different uh, capabilities around us, and we also build teams around those capabilities as well, depending on the client um, uh, sort of problem to solve, um, really helps us to make a difference in the market. And I think that makes us quite unique because typically also um, the more strategic advisory firms, they tend to be limited, limited only around sort of strategic capabilities and they need to partner up with third parties to do the other pieces I just mentioned, uh, yeah. which I think is nice for us. But we, we talk the same language, you know how to find each other. It's easy to sort of also cross offers, cross sort of uh, subsidiary type of uh, team building. And it, for us, it's no limitations of just pulling people together. It's very nice. And from an innovation point of view, there's lots of companies that we see and we talk to who tell us they are innovating or innovative within what they do within the uh, digital commerce tech space. Yes. Uh, how do you think BCG uh, is innovating right now? Yeah, so we're innovating, I think, in, in, in two, two different dimensions. I mean, I think one is really, really sharp in how we look at technology architectures, how we think about how data and, and digital platforms need to be built. Um, we call that internally DDP, the data and digital platform, um, which is a very much of a belief that you need to build architectures in a much more sort of microservices mindset with a very heavy data-driven um, uh, sort of uh, element to it, uh, which to be honest is very close of course with the Mach Alliance is also sort of uh, illustrating as, as well. That is one dimension. The other dimension is much more around becoming a company which is what we call bionic. Uh, so, so really to sort of make sure that you build sort of capabilities within the organization who's both the persons, the individuals working at the company and the technology together work hand in hand very closely to bring the best um, of the people out. Uh, so that's both in internal optimization, but also it's a client, client sort of a customer uh, service. And I think those two elements of both the technology view and having a very clear view of how the organization will evolve over time um, is I think a very strong innovation uh, what we developed over the years and you see now that the type of concept we developed like before COVID almost is now mainstream in, in our advisory services um, in two years later. And, and so you mentioned earlier, there's a gap between what the, what the clients, what uh, the end clients want and what the companies have to offer in terms of tech. Yep. And, and I, I guess that's one of the things that the setup for BCG then allows is to be able to pull from all the different areas to, to create an overall strategy. Absolutely. And we always start with the 
with the consumer and the value creation in mind. Uh, that's, I think, the beauty of how BCG thinks and how we're wired in a way. We always think about value creation first, and then we work our way backwards, you might say, and what are the key capabilities you need to actually establish and deliver that against that sort of value delivery expectation. Um, and I think that's the nice thing about how, how we are sort of wired to think, what are the capabilities we have developed within our company, also how our junior colleagues are being trained, um, is that we very much can, can focus around value delivery, which of course makes it much easier to make the connection between senior management who really needs to be very focused on, on, on the shareholder value and also customer, customer value propositions. And then work your way back in the different departments, like in my case, the technology department, but it's also in the marketing department and the supply chain department and the different sort of elements of, of an organization to then say, okay, how does it not translate for you if you want to, if you need to improve your capabilities for this particular value creation? So it's, it's a very nice sort of um, model, to be honest. And we all talk that same language of, of value focused, uh, which makes it easy to, to bring teams together with the same mindset. Yeah, it sounds good, and it sounds like uh, you have a uh, a good proposition to take into the clients. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was more around the differences between the Dutch, German, Belgian e-commerce market and, and the UK market, because the perception for us is that there there is a gap, maybe a two or three year gap in the uptake of technology and the desire to want to invest in digital channels. There seems to be a lot of focus still on bricks and mortar, opening more stores. Is that gap now closing? Is that something you guys see? Well, I actually would like to pull this broader than just sort of these reasons you mentioned it, Tim. I mean, I think if you compare, for example, China versus uh, Africa versus South America versus the West Coast of the US versus uh, UK, you see all sorts of differences. What I found intriguing is that the differences are being closed quicker than it used to be. Um, and China is ahead of, ahead of the UK and the UK is ahead of Belgium, for example. Eh? So that, that's, that's not a surprise if you look at the numbers. But also when you look, for example, across different verticals, like fashion tends to be behind travel, um, and groceries even further behind typically in, in sort of the adoption of, of, of e-com. I do believe now what you see is actually there's an acceleration happening because of COVID, because you couldn't simply do the physical uh, element for a while in most parts of the world. Um, and there's also an acceleration happening because of technology availability. There used to be a inhibitor of adopting new technologies because of both cost and about sort of and, and, the, and the readiness of technology. And I think that's closing as well. So even though you, you're right, eh? I think you, you're roughly right because that sort of the curve is different. And, and I think the UK is ahead versus Europe. I actually do believe that um, optical retail, uh, it's an optical uh, retailing, so selected like the, 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 where you buy glasses and contact lenses, that happens to be ahead of everyone else. Um, but also, for, also compared to the um, DIY retailer in the UK, for example. And so, so I think if there's not, not not necessarily a country by country difference, I think it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, and I think the gaps are being closed very rapidly because we as customers, like all of us, are customer as well. We tend to create certain expectations now, um, which you expect to, to buy something online in a certain way. And you expect the same sort of behavior also with another vertical retailer where you happen to shop something as well. Um, and if you then travel to China and then you come back again, you sort of expect that same type of behavior happening here as well. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's, so therefore those gaps are closing very rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. I think what is interesting though, that, that you're gonna see the gaps now being closed on the physical store network as well. And, and that is gonna be the cool next wave in my mind. Well, that's something I want to ask you later on, actually, uh, about the use of the physical spaces, but we'll get to that later. Oh, cool, yes. Um, so one of the things uh, that I've, I've seen you speak about recently is the use of, of uh, and the power of digital to optimise. Um, there was an article, I think you did, and you were talking about uh, digitization being central to the, the retailer's long-term potential. Um, have you have you you've have you seen a lot of clients because this was back in March last year you were talking about this and you were telling those clients it really digital has to form that central part of your strategy. Have you seen clients take that advice on and actually implement that? Yes, they, they, they have, and I think um, partly because I think it's still a good advice. <laughs> I think also partly because the world is demanding demanded you to become more digital and digital in the form of online in, in this particular case. So 
not having an online channel was simply hurting you a lot if you were a retailer uh, during the COVID uh, time. So I think that is a very big, so it was a very big incentive for people to really pick it up and to really start driving it. I think the other sort of big dimension is also data analytics. I mean, there's so much sort of knowledge and sort of uh, no, uh, exchange of, of sort of experiences being uh, being done at the moment around how to apply sort of data analytics to your own retail environment to be smarter in building your your assortment and to sort of also to to be, be better in personalization of, of customer experience, so shopping experiences. So I really think that the retailer is really has to pick up those digital capabilities. So I think that's on the demand side, I think is very clear. Um, some are also doing that. Some are doing that themselves. Others are doing that very much with sort of third parties to develop sort of new capabilities. Others are buying software to do it for them, uh, which is another way of doing it. But everybody's trying hard to try to pick up a few elements of it. I think the real trick, trick now is to how to get organized for it. Because I think that's where most sort of retailers are struggling with, to be honest, is how do you now get organized to actually accelerate it? I, mean, I think everybody can do a proof of concept, everybody can do a pilot, but how to now really make it part of your company DNA to really become digital. I think that's the biggest question now for most clients I work with. So without doing a shameless plug, I think one of the key things is, is hiring the right people into the business. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. No, I, I, fully, I fully agree. Yeah. So I also listened to the, your podcast um, with the Mac Alliance mm -hmm. as well. And one of the key takeaways from you was being uh, retailers must uh, not only decompose architecture, but decompose the journey to value creation. And a recent guest of ours was talking about how very much now the customers are in the driving seat. Is that the kind of thing you're referring to? Is that are you alluding to the same thing there? No, partly. I mean, the customers in the driving seat because if they don't see the value of you doing certain things, it simply doesn't make sense to start there. And so, so that's what I mean with sort of value-driven change is you have to sort of really start with where, where value is being seen most, which typically is where customers are being demanding you to go, that which is this customer-driven sort of element of, of, of the other speaker you're referring to. Um, however, there's also other sort of reasons why you want to move in a certain direction. And so there's also internal efficiencies, for example, are very much a good reason to invest in, in digital capabilities, which in my mind are very, are not necessarily directly related to customer demand, but are very much more driven by sort of uh, yeah, common business sense. And so there could be another reason to do that as well. And there's also because there's big value in, in, in there. Um, so it's, it's sort of the same, but not completely, I would say. But for me, the key, the key word is value, value focus, uh, which indeed is very typically demanded by customers because they will determine what's value for them. Yeah, and, and, and value, we, we spoke about this in, in another episode, value very much used to be about just the cost, where yeah. can I get the product the cheapest? Yeah. But actually, there's sustainability, which is um, quite a big topic. Mm -hmm. There's the delivery capabilities. There's the returns uh, issues with, with not going to a company where there is returns are free. So yeah. I think there's more to value in, in a whole than there, than there ever has been, really. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's for me, the, the exciting bit about also being in, a, in an advisory role that whatever we now define as value, we now define as sort of best practice architectures is also evolving, uh, because simply the, the way how we interpret it, the way what we feel is more important, is also evolving. So, so for me, the key thing is not so much to have it right. For me, the key thing is to move to the right direction, and to sort of use language and to learn how to work together in a certain way that you can also adopt and adapt uh, that direction as quickly as possible as well. Uh, but, you, but you're very right. I think the, the, the meaning of value is, is changing rapidly these days. Yeah, and it's, it, and it's the same for me personally. I, I'm, I very much used to use the internet to find the cheapest possible product, but there are so many different things I'm thinking about now um, that retailers then have to adapt to that changing mindset, right? Absolutely. No, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So service is also a really big thing as well with with the ability to be able to interact with your with your customer via whatever the easiest channel might be. Obviously, chatbots is something that has has come to prominence in the last the last couple of years. And, and personally, that's a service that I really like because you can jump on and talk to somebody, whether they're real or not, is a, is a different story. But you generally get your question answered quite quickly. Um, so I find I personally like companies that have that option available should you have any issues with, with the product that you bought 
Fully agree, James. And I think this is this is for me the the interesting development which we saw starting, of course, like um, let's say four or five years ago when these different sort of front ends started to emerge. Uh, where you also had the Alexas and the different type of sort of uh, voice pieces, sort of spoken words type of front ends. Now you see also things like uh, VR, AR popping in. So I think there's a lot of sort of things that happen in this space. I, I fully agree. And, and the customer will decide where we have to be. I mean, I think we can help them a little bit by showing the possibilities of uh, being the technology guys. But I think the customer will in the end decide where most demand will, will happen. Yeah, definitely. And, and in all of those areas that you mentioned, there is so much advancement and uh, there's still so much to come. And in previous episodes as well, we've discussed or, or our, our um, guests have discussed where they believe we are in the journey to their uh, adoption in mainstream. And it'd be interesting to see how they further develop moving forward, too. Um, but interested in going back to the, the Mac Alliance quickly, um, Peter, obviously there's people out there that are very pro the microservices architecture, headless, and being uh, fully Mac. There's others out there that say you really don't need it and it's going to be quite expensive. Where, where do you sit in that uh, in the landscape? Well, both are right, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong in these type of answers. I think you have to pick the right architectures for the right parts of your landscape. Um, if, if you feel that certain parts of your IT landscape require efficiency, stability, uh, low level of change, uh, you want to even sort of maybe outsource to third parties uh, because you think that's simply not, not possible to have capabilities around that internally, then please don't implement massive Mac architectures and make, make life difficult in a way. But if you have an environment which needs speed, which needs agility, which, needs, which most likely will require change, um, then absolutely Mach Alliance, uh, Mach type of architectures are the way to go. Um, and I think that is that is exactly where I think some of the the companies out there go go wrong, or maybe haven't fully embraced the logic of of what math really means. Is you don't need to do microservices everywhere. You go, you need to apply them where it makes sense. And to be honest, it's also how you start. Eh? You don't start with all of a sudden you're monolithic, and the next morning you're all of a sudden microservices everywhere either. So you slowly will work your way into it. And, and I think there's only one sort of type of company which is unique, which are the startups. I mean, they have an opportunity to go fully microservices based right from the go, where it go. But even those guys, they also will have parts of their business which simply need stability. They just need a normal email system or they just need a normal sort of financial accounting system. That'll be a monolithic system to just implement. They don't make a Mach architecture based finance system at the beginning either. Um, so, so I think it's, 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 a, it's a both end. Uh, sort of answer and therefore I don't think you need to choose but I think the key capability you need to develop is to, to decide where do you use what. Yeah so I think it's, it's, I think it's yeah I keep fair to say then that the, the most important thing is to, to take it on the business context and actually what is most relevant for business in said at that particular time. Yeah the, 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 only, the only caveat here James I think people who really get get Mach and uh, really get sort of the microservices architecture uh, thinking they tend to sort of expand the scope of that particular architecture across the landscape much, much further. So apparently there's something in that way of working which really benefits the business as a whole if you really, really get it all the way from business to, to the tech guys together. So, so for example, when you look at um, some companies in China, I mean, they really, really embrace sort of the Mach architecture thinking and they become microservices based almost everywhere. The only thing they don't do is like the finance accounting system and maybe some HR system and that's it. Everything else is fully sort of microservices based. Um, so, so I think there's also a bit of, if you really go at a certain point, you might also flip the whole way, but I don't think that needs to be your ambition. Um, and I think that bond also, that there's also less scary, I do believe for people to move into this type of architecture as well. Yeah, I think if you go straight in fully, then it's going to be very different to what people are used to. And actually, it's embracing it from a, a full business perspective, which often is, is quite challenging. Um, yeah. Whereas if you go in it bit by bit, ultimately, the aim is to decouple each part of it to make it easier to scale and upgrade and maintain and everything else. So that makes complete sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, earlier on, you spoke about the, the, the jump from mainframe to modern architecture back in the early 2000s. And yeah. obviously there are lots of companies that still haven't made the jump from mainframe to, to modern architecture, some of the big oh, banks. They're, they're still around there though. <laughs> yeah. um, do you see some, some similarities 
between that jump to the jump now from where we're at in digital commerce tech to a microservices type environment? Is it a similar kind of thing in your view? Yes, uh, it's very similar. But with, with, the, with the, the slight variance that I do believe that the knowledge and the technology readiness of the, of the target state being microservices and, and, and architectures is actually more ready, more sort of ready to, to adopt. I mean, I think back then you had service oriented architectures with nice sort of Java sort of uh, frameworks around it from uh, either IBM or yet the .NET framework from, from the Microsoft world. Those things were quite early days as well, uh, to be honest, if you wanted to really implement service oriented architectures. Um, I think these days, when you look at the readiness of technology to actually implement the type of microservices and, and the way how also open source is helping us to accelerate quite a bit as well, I actually think you're more ready to, to adopt the, the jump. Having said that, I think the, the mental sort of jump and also the, 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 we spoke quite a bit in the other sort of podcast with the math lines around sort of that you need to let go of the past to sort of embrace the future type of logic. I think that jump is as, as big as it used to be back then. It's a still it's still a big sort of mental jump to take to let go think, of the past. I think that that you can apply that to almost every business. Um, <clears throat> what we do is taken undertaken huge change in the past five years in terms of how you go about doing end to end recruitment. So yeah. it's about very much trying to forget about everything you might have done historically because it, it kind of worked and looking to how you might do things better for the future using all the tech available to you. I fully agree, Tim. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's indeed the same type of jumps. So, from uh, obviously we're speaking about microservices, the Mac Mac Alliance. Um, what do you think uh, is is going to shape the future of digital commerce? We've we've got a number of things that we've seen in the past. We've spoken about about on this podcast with augmented reality, artificial intelligence, chatbots, social commerce. Um, but what for you at the moment is one of the key trends that's shaping that's shaping things? I think the big the big move we will see in retail is actually to, to look at all the wonderful things we've seen in online and then this thing is around chatbots and AR, AR, that it has to find its way into the physical store. I think there's still a massive sort of change to, 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 to happen in the physical world, which I think uh, the, the, the seamless checkout, um, which of course Amazon Go has been pushing furthest in, in the beginning, but now also you see a lot of other startups providing capabilities like that, uh, like Imager, I mean, which is sort of a, a company who's providing those type of capabilities and Zipkin, et cetera, which I think is, a, is, is the next big wave. And the key thing here, what you see is that there is a danger of doing it the same way as you used to do it in e-commerce. You just set up an e-commerce silo next to your, uh, to your business. You're going to set up a, a seamless checkout silo next to your normal POS business. And I think the, 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 the microservices mach architecture thinking helps us here to avoid setting up another silo, but to rethink which components of the sort of normal store world we know today can be sort of broken out uh, and then being sort of replaced by a more seamless checkout type of setup, which more, which typically more video recognition driven, more AI around it, mobile, mobile first, of course, is in there as well. Um, IoT elements in there. So, so it'll be a different sort of architecture, I'm pretty sure. Um, but I think there's a big danger that if you implement it as a silo, you completely lose the plot. You might have a nice sort of experience of seamless checkout, but you don't get any, any of the benefits. And I mm -hmm. think really sort of thinking through, okay, but we need to build this in a mark architecture way. We will all of a sudden really unlock so much potential. Um, I'm almost certain. Yeah, and that was touched upon uh, not last week, the week before, with, with, the, with the use of physical retail space and thinking smart about what you do with it and making it flexible and, and having it as an experience. Absolutely. I mean, nobody knows how the future physical shopping experience will look like. Okay? I mean, I think we just had a massive unexpected wave of, of physical store experiences with all of a sudden nobody expected to have like store closures and then only sort of store pickups being available before you could actually go into the store with maybe 10 people max. And now slowly some of the slum of the world is opening up again with normal sort of shopping behaviors. But you will move to more contactless shopping, which was might look the same as seamless shopping, but might have certain nuances different again. And to be honest, nobody, so nobody knows how we're gonna shop in, in a few few years from now. I think definitely will be, will be an element of convenience or seamless or contactless or whatever you call that. 
um, which I think all has to do with this sort of this this Amazon Go type sort of experience of just walk in and out uh, and pay pay on the go. Um, but it also will be a heavy element of experiences around it. I mean, it won't only be the transaction, but it will be a full experience. You, you want to expect in a, in a physical environment, because otherwise you would have gone online to buy it. Um, and I think this is exactly where also technology will start to play a big role, um, partly by AR, maybe VR, but I, I, I don't think virtual reality will really sort of take off massively there besides sort of gamification environments. Mm. Um, but I think if you then think about okay, how can you improve the sort of experience around a brand, how do you sort of really make the flagship a true flagship as some of the sort of luxury brands are, are doing or even sort of the other uh, consumer products like, for example, Lego, I think they're doing a very nice job in trying to build new experiences around their flagship store and not only for transaction. I think that's going to be the interesting momentum happening. And it's just, it's, you're very right, Tim. I think there's no given future format yet as maybe might never be. So I think you need to stay very flexible in the way how you think about set up your physical store. And therefore you also need to be very flexible in how technology will support it. And that goes back to what you were saying earlier about different parts of uh, retail being at you know, different stages. So the fashion seems to be much further ahead with the use of uh, tech and uh, AR, for example. Yeah. And they found applications for that already, which they're trying to implement in flagship stores. Exactly. And I think here you're going to see the interesting across the globe sort of differences as well, I mean, where different sort of demographics tend to pick up certain digitalization elements faster than others. Um, where, but if, you, if you're a retailer have an opera, sort of a global business, you also need to have certain levels of flexibility in your experience you want to deliver in that physical store environment that maybe, maybe they like AR in, in Germany and in, in the UK, but they don't like AR in, 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 uh, in South, South Africa yet. So how do you make sure that your technology is, is capable of supporting different sort of models um, at the same time uh, without any major sort of additional investments having different silos in different countries, which is a nightmare for support and, uh, and sort of transferability. I was just going to just quickly touch upon Amazon, uh, Amazon Go. You, obviously, very advanced in regards to how they process the payment. You drop it in your basket or your trolley, it processes it, you take it out, it removes it. I mean, to me, that's kind of mind blowing as how something can work that efficiently and that fast. Do you see that as the norm maybe in five years from now across the variety of different retail stores, Peter? Yeah, I see. Maybe the specific experience that Amazon Go is providing, um, and to be honest, also a number of sort of startups are providing as well in, in, in the market. Um, maybe not, not, not that's this, this not necessarily the benchmark, but I do believe there will be a expectation of just picking up from shelves whatever you want to pick, and then by automatically recognizing you as being you, also paying uh, in, in in a very seamless seamless way. Um, I think that that experience is going to be more than all moving forward and that can be done in different ways i mean you don't need to have like virtual cameras cameras everywhere to see what it is you're doing as long as you see what's happening in your basket for example mm -hmm. um so you can also have more sort of different implementations of the same experience uh, in my mind i mean think about what rfid was promising to deliver but i think rfid from a technology component was simply too expensive uh, of course rfid taxes tax costs are reducing and you might get closer to actually making it happen with an rfid tech uh, but I do believe that actually the, the, the video camera type of recognition um, capabilities are getting so good uh, these days uh, that actually it's just a matter of time that, that that will become the mainstream unique identifying technology out there, um, which I think is going to be a very nice way. And then you're very, getting very close to this, as you said, the default experience with people are simply going to be expecting moving forward. That's it. Yeah. And I guess uh, that recognition then moves into some form of like digital wallet where it is associate your your personal profile with uh, a, a bank account of some type and payments coming in and out of that as you move in and out of the stores. Yeah, I guess. Sorry. No, I mean, I think, bit, uh, yes, that's a, that's the technology sort of direction. Eh? You can see that sort of going quite nicely. I think counteracting this, of course, this customer sort of expectations and there's some legal sort of implications around this as well, like privacy and, and, and also the way how you would like to be recognized by, by the retailer and, and sort of work together with, with the retailer to provide you the best service. 
And I think that also here, there's, there's no real answer yet. I think we, we do need to be careful and not just getting IT ahead of themselves and implementing the most wonderful recognition and sort of self-payment uh, services, but actually leaving behind the customer experience and but also the legal implications of, uh, around GDPR, et cetera. So I think that's definitely the last word has been said around this, but I do believe it's going to be a super exciting time to see how this will evolve um, in the years to come. Certainly, yeah, the next few years are going to be very interesting um, in outlining that customer experience as you go either shopping or to uh, the mall, for example, for a, a full day out. Talking about digital wallets, um, this might be something that Tim was going to ask, but I feel like we've moved on quite nicely, and that's mm -hmm. cryptocurrency within retail. Yeah. Um, someone, uh, a previous guest mentioned that they see that as one of the biggest disruptors to retail in the next few years. What would be your thoughts on that, Peter? But there's two ways to think of it. I mean, cryptocurrency, it, it, in the end, it is, you can either see it as just another payment method. And then I do believe it is just sort of an evolution of, of cash versus uh, card to chip to NFC to crypto, <laughs> sort of is one way to look at it. Um, I think the other way to, to look at this, I think I would actually not look at cryptocurrency as, as sort of the payment method as such, but I would look to blockchain as a capability of, of sharing data in a, in a trustworthy, secure way. And I think as soon as you start to think in that direction, I don't think it's only the payment which you can sort of use the blockchain logic for, but it's also the, the share of personalized data or, or product data, or even the sales supply chain of efficiency within the retailer as well. And I think therefore blockchain as a, as a capability is a very interesting one to watch uh, because I think that might actually solve some of the uncertainties and, and, uh, and the pain we have we see at the moment around sort of sharing data and, and, and how do you know something is trustworthy. Um, I think that's going to really solve, solve that one. So I'm, I fully agree with blockchain is going to be really a big game changer for retail moving forward. I'm not really sure if cryptocurrency as an example of, of blockchain implementation is going to be such a disruptor. Okay. For, for me, that's just another payment method uh, to, to put it super simple, but I, I know some of the experts don't, don't agree with me on that one. I'm sure there's a lot of opinions when it comes to crypto, particularly given the amount is in the news at the minute anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very volatile, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it depends what part of crypto you want to sort of focus on. I mean, if you focus on the value of the, of the, of the, of the uh, currency, then of course it's a very different sort of discussion. If you want to focus on the ease of transaction, I think that is what for me that's what I call the blockchain effect of, of, of cryptocurrency. That I can clearly see there's 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 a there's a benefit there uh, to to gain. One hundred percent. So many of them are, are bringing the the cost uh, down tremendously, as well as the actual speed from A to B. Um, it's far far improvement to to where it was a couple of years back now. Yeah. The only interesting thing I do believe that we also need to be careful here is that what is the incremental sort of um, value or the benefit of moving from, for example, from, from NFC or mobile wallet to cryptocurrency all of a sudden. I, I wonder if there's something with the same, same discussion we had from, okay, what's the additional benefit of going from a barcode to an RFID tech? Uh, that's a little bit of a discussion there as well. And now I think you're being bypassed by, by, by video recognition. Um, so I think we have to be careful as well that some steps help you to move forward. And then the, the next incremental step, which sounds super cool from a technology point of view, but actually not from an experience point of view, we did that big anymore. And, and that is again, what I've always feel so passionate about is having this value driven focus uh, first. So okay, what's the value you want to still unlock? And if that indeed is a really big value step, then maybe you need to go back to the technology which can be implemented. But if the technology is super cool, but the incremental value step is very low, then we all know that business cases don't fly. So therefore, yeah, you always have to argue, doesn't really help you to get somewhere. Mm. Okay. All right, interesting. So we, uh, I think we've covered quite a bit already, to be honest. <laughs> more, than, <laughs> <You did. laughs> more than I anticipated, but uh, we've got three questions that we, um, we'd like to, to ask everyone to just really get to grips with what, what they think the future of digital commerce tech holds. Um, the first question, and I, I appreciate it'll be hard because there's quite quite a few things that we anticipate will impact retailers, but if you had to choose one thing, what would be the single biggest challenge you think is going to be there for retailers right now? Uh, 
Well, of course, retailers, there's, there's, again, there's so many different retailers, so many different locations. You can be a retailer in somewhere in, around the world. Yeah. But I, if I think about the common thread of the retail clients I talk with, it is all about, okay, I know I need to do stuff. I know I, know I need to become digital. I know I need to change the way we think about using technology. But where do I start? And how do I find the people to help me to do that? Uh, so, so I can clearly see that as sort of a really big challenge. Again, it's quite generic because it depends what retailer you are and where you are and what sort of customer demographic you'd like to serve. Uh, but I can clearly see that as a really big challenge. So what is the, the, the digital opportunity to jump on and how do I get, find the right people to do that with? Um, and I think that's because there's so much good examples out there these days that it's very difficult to find which one makes sense for you. Again, use the value-driven approach, which really helps you to make sense of out of all of that. And the other piece is, okay, if you want to find the right people to work with, um, you most likely won't find them in, in your own internal company right now. So you need to really think about, okay, which are the ones which might be able to help me to change? Uh, but how do I also partner up, find new resources, uh, work with startups? I mean, be creative to try to find people to work with to actually get the new things done. Uh, so I would say those are really big, big challenges for retailers right now. So really, it's the, taking the desire to want to have your digital channels and, and invest in them, but finding the right vendors and making sure that you've got the right support internally and externally to create your vision. Exactly. And please do, do note that, that I take it very much of a technology lens in this question. So there's plenty of other challenges that retailers have these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's certainly a huge amount to overcome for sure. Um, moves on to the second, uh, second question, Peter. We, we, we've kind of just discussed this um, a few moments ago. Um, um, however, the question is, uh, do you see a place for the high street in the next couple of years? Um, we, we touched upon how, um, how companies might potentially innovate over that period of time, but how do you think it will look? Yeah, so the high street... Retail is, is here to stay. I'm, I'm very certain that there will be a reason for, for experiences people would like to still have with retailers and brands. And I think what we'll see is we'll see a, sort of a, a growth of the different type of, of companies who present themselves in the high street. I think that consumer products will also just come to high streets right away um, instead of going through retailers. Uh, so I think you're going to change, see a bit of a change of the logos on, 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 the, on the window, I think, uh, moving forward as well. Um, but that there's a high need for high street, yes, absolutely. You, you you go to the high street for transactions, just buying stuff. I think they'll become less and less. I think you come to the high street to to experience, to be excited, to be entertained, um, to still be to have a seamless experience. Uh, if you want to get something, you can get it. Uh, so I think there's still an element of that as well. Um, but I can clearly see that the high street is here to stay, and there's still a reason for people to go and have a great experience when they go out for shopping. Um, the way how you do that, the way how you interact with the brands, the type of layout of a store will definitely look different. Um, the data is going to change. Um, how is it really going to look? Uh, I have no clue, but I would say we'll travel around the world and, and look for examples. We'll definitely give you some uh, sort of ideas maybe already. Yeah, we've already seen a bit of change, not only on the high street, but in some of the, the bigger shopping centers where um, they formed older shops into car showrooms, for example, and other companies that are going down like the Apple approach, where it's very interactive, it's minimal and simplistic, and having that real customer focused experience. Uh, it seems like we'll get more of that, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then also the sports apparel sort of brands who organize like yoga classes in the store and those type of things, so just to get people in the store to get a great experience. And then, by the way, we also sell stuff, type of, uh, type of uh, ideas. Um, but you're right, I think we already see a change. And I think that's why I think we can all imagine what type of change it will be, um, how far and how fast. I think it'll heavily depend on the on the, lo on the location, the part of the world we're in, um, for sure. And also that desire that you touched upon uh, previously. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so then again, we, we've touched on a number of different disruptive technologies within digital commerce. But if you had to choose one that you think was going to have the biggest impact in the next 12 months, what, what, would, you, what would you opt for? 
So it depends a little bit what you mean with what the, the tech. I mean, so, so for me, the tech can mean like different type of uh, uh, ways of how technology is being developed, different type of uh, physical hardware elements we'll see out there. But for me, the biggest disruption is going to be really knowing and understanding how to build the microservices set up. Uh, I think we've seen so many examples already over the years, but I think the ones who really are able to mic build microservices at the right level of granularity with the right level of sort of capabilities internally to own it and to maintain it as a product, I think that will be the biggest sort of disruption because as soon as you get that right, I think then you almost don't care what the customer demand will be. You almost don't care what new technologies will come up because you just plug and plug and play, replace sort of certain pieces of your microservices architecture to enjoy that new capability. So I think that's the biggest disruption. And I think we're now getting really close to the promise, which I think we've seen already for quite a few years, uh, that actually you can just plug and play. I actually strongly believe that, that now with the true thinking about microservices, we're going to be pretty close to that. OK. And do you think that holds true across every tier of retail? So you have your large tier ones, your slightly small tier twos. Do you think that still is the one of the biggest fundamental changes that would impact retail? Yeah, absolutely. I think as, as any tech disruption, you'll see certain disruption, certain retail verticals being disrupted earlier than others. Um, so I think, yeah, you're going to see that, for example, the online retailers are already doing it. I mean, I think there's no real disruption needed there. Um, if you look at, for example, fashion, as you said, I mean, they start to see the disruption happening right now. I think now what I see with most of my clients as well, the grocery retail, for example, is being heavily disrupted now as well. So I think you're going to see different sort of verticals being disrupted at different times and then also different parts of the world being disrupted at different times as well. So, so I would say there's no retailer who won't see that disruption coming along. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. There's been so much good insight there into digital commerce tech and we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, go through your views and uh, give us that insight so yes thank you very much peter much appreciated well thanks tim thanks james for a great discussion thank you very much amazing thank you thank you to all the listeners can't believe we're on our fifth podcast already but we appreciate everyone's time and we'll see you again for the next episode mm -hmm.